Hi everyone and welcome to a new episode of Swisspreneur. My name is Sylvan and I will be your host today. Today we're going to have a chat with Iman Navi about B2B sales. You already got to know Iman in the last episode where he talked to us about his involvement from a family businessman to a multi-million dollar startup company. In today's episode, he will share his B2B sales experiences and also his framework about how B2B sales should be done as an early stage startup. Let's have a chat with Iman. Before we get started with the episode, I would like to introduce you to SPB Startup. If you think that your company is a good fit for the Swiss Railways, get in touch with them or learn more about their startup programs at spbstartup.com. Iman, welcome back to the second episode of Swisspreneur. It's a pleasure to have you again. Hi. Today we're going to talk about B2B sales how that works, how to set it up, and how to also make it successfully. And I would like to start with the first question. What mistakes do you see Swiss startups making repeatedly when it comes to B2B sales? Okay, first of all, when, before I answer this question, I want to tell you that I'm not an expert in B2B sales. I had to realize that, okay? So everything that I'm going to tell you right now is just coming from the experience of the last two to three years. and a lot of mistakes that uh, I made myself. And I think these are probably the best learnings that you can give us today. Uh, I hope so, because um, there are a lot of mistakes you do uh, in, in, in a startup, in a B2B startup when it comes to sales. So to get back to your question, um, when I started, uh, when we started Advertima three years ago, I already told you in the first episode, um, we already had a customer that was paying um, a big amount of money that we deliver him our software in a new space in a, in a shopping center. Mm -hmm. And um, therefore, the sales process at that moment was just intuitive. It was, I had as a visionary guy to tell to another visionary guy, this is going to be great and he is going to be the hero and uh, we were going to be the heroes together. And he said, okay, let's do it. So I believe that this is sales. Basically go into customer and tell him, take this and we are going to be, uh, we, are, we are going to set up a big project together. Mm -hmm. But it's not. So the first time we realized that was when we went to other customers. So, uh, Basically, no, we didn't even realize it. We realized it about one or two years later. Um, so in the end, every single sale that um, I was able to, 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 to do it was, was to visionary guys. Mm -hmm. But you, you are a good salesperson in B2B when you can really sell to normal people. The, the, the normal people are not the visionary, innovative guys who risk a lot. So uh, I would say the first one to two years, it was more luck than something else that we met the right people or we, we, we met a lot of people and uh, the guys who actually bought uh, from, from our company were the innovative guys. So at some point when we wanted to grow faster, we realized that it's not going that well. And that was uh, the, the time when we brought in also some experience from externals when it comes to B2B sales. So the biggest mistakes that startups do is basically believing that you can sell stuff intuitively and just uh, stand there. And maybe, maybe the CEO, the founder of the, of the company can even do that, but not a normal sales. Person. I mean, you also have a pretty different standing if you go to a sales meeting and you are the founder or the CEO of a company, basically. Exactly. This is something completely different. So um, we even started to give uh, any titles to, to young people who uh, <laughs> should go out and, and sell because we believe the title is uh, key. But basically, there are one or two people in the company who can do that. And okay. uh, th those are the real founders because they can talk very visionary about their baby, their product. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to B2B sales, you have to realize that it's more systematic and... Uh, methodology that uh, plays into the success. I want to talk about that in a second because I think this is a very interesting takeaway to, to sort of map a blueprint sales process or how you do it today. Before we do that, I would like to go back to your first big client. 
Uh, I think you closed a, a seven digit ticket uh, with a big client without actually, you know, having something in the market yet. So they, they still pre-financed that. It was really a visionary sale as you, as you discussed or mentioned it before. How did he make that happen? Because when you go out and you just have your idea, how do you get in touch with the right people? How do you know where you should go and how do you then actually make a deal happen? And how long does it take? Also important. I have to say, um, first of all, um, the, the seven digits, they came later. So okay. in the beginning it was lower, but uh, we were focusing only on one customer mm -hmm. and uh, the project became bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was a, uh, like an iterative uh, process of selling and upselling until we had uh, this, this big amount of money. So th that, that was basically um, not from the beginning like that. So not even I was that lucky to have a customer who is paying in advance that, that, that money. So it was a lot of work to deliver such a big project. Finding out who are, who are the right people to approach means a lot of research. But a lot of research in, in a way that you really have to understand how sales works. So uh, what I can guarantee you is if you don't have B2B ex uh, sales experience, you are going, even with a lot of research, you are going to do the wrong stuff, I guess. So understanding um, what, how a company works, a prospect works, uh, internally, you have different stakeholders and uh, trying to find out uh, who these stakeholders are and uh, how they think and what exactly you have to deliver them to, uh, to, to uh, meet their expectations and all this stuff is very difficult and should be done in a systematic way. Okay. So um, I would say if you really have a B2B startup, first of all, get coaching from B2B sales experts and understand what um, the sales process should look like. Um, understand who are, the, what is an economic buyer, technical buyer and all this stuff. And then start to research before you go to a customer, just talking to him and wasting time. So how does such a B2B sales process look like nowadays at, at Vertima? At Advertima? For example, or you can also share a blueprint how you would set up a B2B sales process based on your experience that you have now. Yeah, basically, I have only the experience I had in Advertima. So uh, I can tell you how we do it here. So we have this um, sales team with three different uh, teams inside. So the sales development team, we have three people who are responsible to get from the marketing the go-to-market strategy and based on the go-to-market strategy um, go out and find leads. You can find leads, it depends on what you're selling. Mm -hmm. For us, for example, the website is not uh, for lead generation. Mm -hmm. It's more about redirecting um, um, on, the, on the website. But um, the lead generation happens with uh, research on Google, basically. You go out, what the go-to-market strategy says, for example, shopping centers and sell uh, to shopping centers in, in, in Europe, for example, and then the sales development team is going to uh, uh, look who are the exact players that we need right. and they qualify the leads, they put them on Salesforce and Salesforce is, by the way, you have to adapt everything in Salesforce to, uh, to, to your process, to the internal process, that is very important. And they uh, qualify them, them, they contact them, and if they answer, they set up a discovery meeting. And at that point, when the discovery meeting has to take place, salespeople, or we call, we call them account manager already, right. um, they come into the game and they, uh, they go through the discovery call, usually a call, not a meeting, because we don't really know if uh, this is a waste of time or not. Right. Then um, uh, we have a clear process how to um, lead through the discovery meeting, what kind of questions to ask to know exactly is this um, a potential sales at some point or not. 
And if after the discovery call, we believe we can close a deal during the next three to six months, this becomes an opportunity inside Salesforce as well. And this opportunity is then um, transferred to the account manager and he has to close the deal. But we have also three times a week, we have these sales meetings uh, where um, experienced person, an advisor that we have, uh, Alexandra Eberhard, is, um, is, is teaching us how to do sales in, in B2B and um, what, what to do next with the customer and she knows exactly what the reaction of the customer means what. So the process in the beginning is sales development until it's opportunity after it's uh, afterwards it's um, it's it's a account manager thing to lead them from 10 percent probability of closing to 100 percent and afterwards um, when it comes all oh, in between of course the third team is the solution consulting team or pre-sales okay. and these guys are the ones who uh, come to the customer and understand how to use our solution uh, to solve the problem of the customer. So it's not like selling apples, it's, I mean, apple as a fruit. Yes. <laughs> so it's really a, a solution business and it's complex, it's really complex. I think this is a very good overview and I would like to go a bit deeper into the specific areas that you just mentioned. So the first step that you said was there's, for marketing, there's a go-to-market strategy, which gives you a targeted group or a buyer persona that you have to pursue. How do you determine these? Who, who sets these personas or these target clients that you should go after and how do you do this? We have a role in our company, vision and strategy. This role is at the moment I'm responsible for the role vision and strategy. I always was. So I define the vision and the strategy of the company with um, the, my, my team and this vision and strategy, like you have the vision, you have a mission, you have a strategic road, you derive basically everything from this strategy. So you have also, uh, we have, for, for example, we have a five years strategic road and uh, we have an 18 month milestone uh, definition, five miles, milestones that we have to, uh, during the next uh, 18 months. And uh, for these milestones, we define um, OKRs. And from these OKRs, we derive circle OKRs, so team OKRs. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a top-down approach of um, implementing the strategy into the company. Right. So this strategy that is implemented into the company defines also for the marketing team what, what to do and what to define. And the go-to-market strategy is derived from the company strategy and the sure. roadmap that we have and uh, is handed over to the sales team. So if we say, for example, Advertima wants to uh, become the standard technology when it comes to visual interpretation of people in the physical space. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to do that, you have to understand what is the technology that you build and uh, who are your customers who, who would buy it. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, you define who, what market, what, what uh, industries and verticals are going to buy your technology uh, most probably. This is an assumption or this is something that you have raw data? In the, in the beginning, it's always an assumption yeah. and you, you have to try out what works out and what not. And uh, if you have a really complex product in a really complex market it's uh, after three years we still can say okay this is the vertical and we are going to just scale with two use cases and one vertical right so that's not possible yet yeah. my job is to um, at some point find the focus mm -hmm. so two years ago we tried out everything one year ago we, uh, we tried out half of it <laughs> and then we right now we, f we are focusing on two industries and some about eight use cases is this something that you think is very important to also get results to have this clear focus and really also focus on two industries as you do now to get better sales results it's it's very important we have we have even um, in the meantime we have sales sprints even where we say, okay, we have a sprint of uh, three weeks where salespeople and the marketing people who are supporting the salespeople um, 
they, they just focus on maybe one use case and try to sell this use case to one industry, one vertical. Okay, cool. So we have that in the meantime, but we, we didn't have that in the beginning. So this is also something that we had to learn yeah. for, from Makes sense. the, yeah. Um, I mean, there are ideas you have. When you have a problem as a private person and then you realize how to solve it and this is your business idea, it's much easier. <laughs> but in our case, it was like, it still is. It's, it's about, okay, if we really focus on one industry and one use case too early, mm -hmm. it could be the, yeah, that could be the, the end of the startup. Sure. Because you are putting all your resources in exactly one uh, way and that could be the wrong way. So I was always um, um, a fan of going different directions mm -hmm. and get feedback and see what direction is the right one. This, so this sounds very logical, right? But uh, it's, it's not always, it's difficult to find the balance. So right. I was criticized also very, very hard because um, you have, of course, investors, they want short-term sales. Yes. And I was saying, okay, if we really go for short-term sales, we have to sell stuff to the customer that he really wants right now. Mm -hmm. And then you focus, you put all your resources in these use cases that you sell. So you sell something, a use case to a, to a customer, and then the whole technology team has to, um, ha has to understand what this use case is and the roadmap, the technology roadmap is built for this use case. And six months later, you realize that this use case is not scalable and, um, no other customers don't want it or in on the other hand um, on the other side of the world somebody else is building the same much better than you mm -hmm. so you listen to the customer you deliver the use case the whole company is building the technology in a way that the use case can be delivered to the market and then you realize oh that was a bad idea so i was that's really difficult to find the, the right way so in the meantime, after three years, we have two industries and some use cases, but I'm still not ready to say, okay, let's focus on one industry and one use case for the next six months, because that could be a big mistake. Uh, but what we do is sprints, sales sprints. So the technology is, uh, roadmap is clear right now in the meantime, uh, what, what, what has to be built, but the sales team is focusing on one use case or two use cases for one vertical. And after three weeks, we have feedbacks. We, we know exactly what, how the market reacted. And then we know, okay, the next sprint is coming. Uh, let's try out this use case or let's go on with the, with the old use case. What would you need to make uh, a safe bet from your end uh, or from your position where you can say, I focus on just this industry, one industry and one use case. What's currently missing in order for you to get there? What do you need to, to have this certainty where you can say, with a good consciousness that you say, I focus on one industry and one use case. You know, um, what we are building needs hardware and we, are, we, we have an edge-based architecture. So it's not cloud-based, it's complex. So it's not only complex, the sales cycles are very, very long as well. So um, it's not like in the cloud where you can just go to the customer, give him in a freemium model uh, your product just for free for three months and you can try out and if you want it, you can just put your credit card inside and then you can go on. It's not like that. Sure. We have to go to the customer and tell him the value proposition and if he really believes in it, he will ask for the price and then he will realize, oh, I have to install hardware inside my store, mm -hmm. inside the physical space. Yeah, that's and a huge that, investment, I guess. Exactly, that's an investment. So uh, at some, it's it's much, it's it's really difficult to sell uh, sell this. You don't have a lot of references, but you you tell about value propositions, and he's asking about references. Okay, show me <laughs> references because I have to spend uh, twenty thousand, thirty thousand uh, just on hardware implementation. So, right, it's difficult. So um, to, to uh, get back to your question, um, we have the first phase in the sales process is a proof of value project. Mm -hmm. Usually we even pay the hardware by ourselves to do the proof of value in the meantime. Okay. Then if you show the proof of value and we have 2019, in the meantime, they just don't just take it because they love it, the technology, you have to deliver numbers. 
So you have to deliver a return on investment in the proof of value. If you don't, forget it. So after you have delivered the return on investment uh, calculation and it shows that there is a return on investment, you can talk about the small scale rollout. That means just maybe in the shopping center case, just one shopping center. And then at some point you have uh, shown after, I mean, the proof of value project goes about three to six months. Mm -hmm. Then you have the decision phase of, uh, again, three to six months for this uh, small scale rollout. And then it takes, um, I don't know how long because we are not there yet. So we have never done a large scale rollout because we are on the market since three years. Yeah, and, and that probably takes longer than that. Yeah, it's, it's getting shorter. The sales cycles are getting shorter, but uh, because we know how to sell and what to sell, the value proposition, proposition is clearer. But I guess uh, um, it will take us, in the end, still one and a half to two years to come to a, a large-scale rollout. That means going out and roll out, for example, um, 100 stores. We'll see that from you in the future. So one day we'll read the big headline that you do a big rollout over. We'll be able to use your technology, hopefully. Hopefully in the next two years. That would be cool. Now we discussed the first part, marketing, setting the, the target clients and the buyer persona. Then you hand this over to your sales development reps that generate leads. How does that work? What activities do they do and where do they look for leads and how do they qualify them? Um, you know, in the meantime, I'm not, not anymore very involved in this process since it's working very well. I mean, my job is as the founder and CEO, my job is also when, when I see something is working very well, um, I, I have to go on and look for something else that I can fix. It's sure. like, um, I don't focus on that anymore, but it's, it's working. And what they do is, um, I, I know that Googling is still one of the most important uh, tools. But um, we go also to events in the meantime. Okay. So events are very important. So industry events, mm -hmm. since um, the whole industry is gathering there. And uh, if you do a good job at the event, you can, in a systematic way, uh, generate a lot of leads. How does that look like in, in practice, for example? Do you yeah. offer a competition? Do you ask, are you interested to learn more? And then they can sign up somewhere. How does that look in practice? Um, we have a showcase. Looks very good. So we have our, our showcase at the event, um, at the fair. And uh, when people walk by, they realize what this is about and they basically ask us. They, as soon as somebody is looking to the screen, to the, to the showcase we have, we, we approach them as well. And then we have pre um, prepared, of course, um, um, a paper with, uh, that where we can just uh, note who this person was and um, that's the normal way and when we come back to switzerland again it's yeah by the way there there are no fares for our industry in switzerland so <laughs> it's directly a blow uh, it's an international business for us so when we come back to switzerland uh, it's about putting these leads into salesforce and distributing them to the people uh, who can approach those and then how does that look like so once you get the contacts either on google or at an event you get in touch with the people. Yeah, it's email. Okay. It's uh, sending them an email, but the, the content of the email is highly individualized. Okay, in yes. what regard? For example, it, first of all, the industry. Mm -hmm. So the first two years I can remember when I, I went to customers, I had only this one pitch showing how cool our technology is, yeah. and this is not the way you can sell stuff. So um, the problem, the solution that you tell to the investor, for example, um, is not going to bring you any sales. So you have to, it, the, the concept of a pitch is almost the same, mm -hmm. but the problem and the solution is completely different at the customer side. So you have to, un you have to talk about industry problems and um, trends. Mm -hmm. So um, showing him that you understand his pains and then show him how your technology is going to solve these problems and how. And so we have for each industry we approach or we approach, we, we had different sales pitches, pitch decks. Mm -hmm. 
So um, yeah, in the email it's the same. So you have to catch this guy because uh, and show him by showing him that you know the industry, the pains, and you know his company, and uh, you know exactly what the pains of his company are. So it's a lot of research and uh, spending a lot of time in in this first email discover. Uh, this, this uh, email that you send out. So you really need to develop this understanding and try to map your solution to the priorities and, and problems that they want to solve at their company. Exactly. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is why I love this um, sales sprint thinking, mm -hmm. because you have a lot of people who are working on one industry vertical, one or two use cases. And um, then you have this collective learning people discussing with each other, focused on, on one problem, two problems. And that makes, makes you, in the end, you, you think, okay, if I have 10 different industry, um, use cases uh, and, and, and verticals uh, for, uh, from industries, you believe that you are going to be very slow if you go sprint by sprint, but it's not. In the end, you are much faster. Because you build up the know-how for this specific industry, right? Exactly. Yep. Then once you send the emails and there is an interest, what happens next? Do you jump on a call with them or what happens after the email? Yeah, in the beginning we went to the customer, but that's that, that you shouldn't do that. No. The discovery meeting is made over Skype. Okay. So we have Skype for business and uh, uh, there you can also show slides, but basically we only, in the meantime, we only show two slides. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what, what do they say? The slides, yeah. showing that we understand the industry and the pains of the industry, and then we uh, we we start talking to the customer about his problems. And you basically uh, ask a lot of questions at that stage, yes. right? Yes. Cool. And uh, it's it's very fun. The in the discovery meetings, the customers or the prospects that we have, they start to ask us stuff. Okay. So it's it's a it's a little fight between who, who, who is allowed to um, ask the questions. So, um, I mean, they know their problems and they believe that they, if they understand our solution, they can decide by themselves yes. if uh, our solution is going to help or not. So it's a big fight, it's a, little, it's a small fight at least uh, to, to get the, the lead of the thought and ask them questions and uh, understand their pains. Mm -hmm. Because then you know your solution much better than they could ever. So uh, then you can suggest um, in, in the end how to do it. So, but uh, what we also realized is um, the first the discovery call shouldn't even be about solutions mm -hmm. um, and how you can solve it, their problems. You, we, we just have to somehow give them, uh, make them confident that we are going back to our office and maybe one week later we set up another meeting and we will come up with uh, some good ideas how we okay. solve it. So it's really first understand in a discovery call and ask as many questions and gather as many information as possible to then be able for a later meeting or call to, whatever to, suggest some to come solutions. up with a good solution that fits their, their needs basically. Yeah. Exactly. And these are exactly the stuff that you have to learn from experts. Mm -hmm. And if uh, the sooner you do it, the better. And then the goal of this qualification call, which is still done by the sales development rep, if I understood that correctly, is to set up a next meeting or to qualify if they are a good fit for a next call or meeting. Ah, that, I, I don't know which way is the better way, still not, but uh, the sales development people are going for discovery meetings and the sales people as well. So they Okay, so you have both people there. If you have the, 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 the situation or um, if you are lucky enough to have both people inside the call, it's of course perfect. Sure. But um, I don't know which, which uh, works better. I don't know. Okay. So of course, um, as if you are as the founder and CEO in the call, it's much better. Um, but you can't do that always. No. It's, it's clear. So I can't answer that question. But then the next step basically is you have the discovery call. Then the next thing is a meeting or a web call through Skype business again to come up with a solution, with a proposal, basically. Exactly, um, really high level, to yeah. just show him that we know, we understand uh, what's going on mm -hmm. in his company, and with our solution, he has a good shot to uh, solve the problems. Okay, and then the goal is to create an opportunity out of that, right? It's already opportunity after the discovery meeting. Okay. 
So official opportunity in Salesforce is uh, before we start thinking about solutions. Okay. And uh, after in this solution meeting afterwards, um, we if, if he says, um, okay, I think this could be interesting, we then start to build the offer conception mm -hmm. and that is more detail. And then the account executive or account manager, I, don't, I think you call them account manager, mm -hmm. then they take over that contact and want to close them within a certain time frame. Exactly. And if needed, they, uh, they bring in an executive uh, sponsor. Mm -hmm. So this is the C-level, like okay. the CEO or somebody uh, from the board yes. to, to just bring this, to um, increase um, the chances of closing. Mm -hmm. What methods or what tactics do you have there or what activities do you follow? I mean, one thing is that you have an additional Skype call, but what happens then after this Skype call until you, you have actually to meet close this them? person for sure face to face? Okay. So if possible, you, you meet this person face to face. I, I can't remember that we closed any deal without meeting the people. So in this okay. process, you have to build trust and uh, you can't build trust just over Skype. Mm -hmm. So um, what we do is the offer conception usually is done uh, with a presentation at the customer customer's office. Right. If you have the possibility to bring the customer to your office, it's great, of course, because it's like, yeah. Home it's, game. Yeah, exactly. It's home <laughs> game, but it's not that easy always. So, uh, of course, the customers, um, they know that you want to bring them to the office. Mm -hmm. and uh, But we have, the, for example, the showcase that we have. It's, it's a good reason to bring them to the office, but uh, still, I would say 80-90% of the customers are not doing that, so you have to visit them. Yeah. So you visit them with the offer conception, and then usually they uh, go back again for three weeks, four weeks, mm -hmm. to uh, discuss it internally. And right. nowadays they have, um, they have about 20 projects on the table, and they have to decide what to do, so it's not sure. that easy. To convince them okay uh, you have a budget of half a million for example what to spend in so uh, from the online uh, digital for example online uh, solutions they have on the table it's much easier to understand than a new solution so mm -hmm. um, it's much easier and less ri uh, risky for the operational people to decide to go for such uh, online um, uh, projects where uh, there are already references sure. so that's that's the difficult part so be, being in touch um, like uh, two three times a week without them thinking that you are a pain <laughs> so that's the difficult part so a good salesperson is uh, is managing this game it's a game as you say i i like that comparison yeah, and you have to be talented. It's really also about talent. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm talented in sales. I, I believe when I, when I sell stuff, it's more my position and my, my love for the technology and the company that um, increases the, the probability of sales. Sure. But there are, I was really impressed by some people, how they manage this game of, of sales. And um, it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, about talent, but most importantly, it's about really methodology and um, mm -hmm. it's about structure, about experience. It's about uh, knowing how to react on or how to interpret people. Like usually the customer tells you stuff and you really have to think about the, re uh, the meaning and the reason he said stuff yeah. because he's not going to tell you. I think especially in Switzerland, you know, people don't like to tell you no, so they probably always postpone you to later on, later on. And then it's sometimes can be pretty difficult to really exactly. read between the lines. Are they really not interested or are they just, you know? Exactly. So sometimes we, we believe we are at 90% closing. So we work with the uh, um, probabilities of closing in Salesforce. I mean, every B2B sales team does that. Sure. So sometimes you believe you are at 90% because um, there is maybe a term sheet uh, that you that you signed and after some weeks you realize, oh God, we were at 30% maybe. Right. So um, these are stuff, uh, interpreting people, your prospects, it's, it's a difficult thing for 
juniors and unexperienced people. Sure. Yeah. And that is something that you can only learn if you have experience. It, during that, let's say, closing process, what other circumstances or supporting materials can actually help you to close a deal faster or also increase the probability of closing a deal? For example, when you started out, you won a lot of startup competitions. You were in the media like everywhere. Probably I read an article about you every week, basically. Was that something that also helped you to close deals? Or is this really a, a very people and relationship focused business where you actually get the deal, deals closed by showing up at their location and following up in person? I am 100% sure that being in newspapers is not going to help you to close. Okay, why not? Not at all. Because closing a B2B deal, um, it, uh, I mean, we are not selling stuff that costs 10,000. It's a yeah. big project and the rollout is much more expensive. And um, so it's, it's not helping you. It, the only thing is awards that we won, the ICT Newcomer Award for in 2017, for example, was uh, is, it's the biggest prize you can get in, in Switzerland as a yeah. startup. So this was bringing us publicity mm -hmm. and it was bringing us um, leads, easier okay. leads. Yeah. If we wrote to people, we have in our email signature still that we won that prize. So that helps to get discovery meetings, for example, but not more. Okay. So but it's good for an initial contact, but it doesn't help you to close no, the deals? No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. So the only thing that helps you to close deals is uh, having references from other customers and projects with real return on investment. Um, yeah. calculations showing that there is a value that you brought to them. This is the only thing that helps you. And there was something else. Um, in 2018, GDPR came to Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, since we are using computer vision, we are, com we are completely compliant with right. the laws, right? We built our whole architecture in a way um, back in 2016 even to, to be uh, privacy compliant. Mm -hmm. But that that was not the point of the customer. So when GDPR came, they were unsecure about the reaction of the, of the people, yes. of their customers, right. of the consumers. So they just um, stopped buying stuff from us mm -hmm. and from the whole industry that was using uh, computer vision in retail and commercial centers. So what helped in closing deals again was that we were able, at, after some months, and a lot of work and effort to get into the office of uh, Adrian Lopsiger, the Swiss uh, officer for the highest officer for data privacy, Edup, the Datenschutzbeauftragte der Schweiz. And um, and he was uh, looking at our solution and um, he we, we prepared everything and he was basically saying, okay, that, that's okay what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And Two months later, um, a jour journalist asked him about Advertimus Solution and he gave, gave a statement. Usually he's, he's not giving any statements. Oh, but so, that's like the best publicity you can have or ask for in that moment, right? Publicity, I would call it, it was, it, it saved our lives. It's like, <laughs> it's <laughs> you like. You can also put it that way for sure, yes. Yeah, it was like, um, it was needed. Yeah. Because after this article, our customers were, okay, Let's do it again. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's actually a funny thing from the B2B area, right? They need to have some external proof that things work without actually doing the proof on their own first. Mm. It, it's probably a, ma a matter of trust to, to know. It's risk. I know, like to have the trust that this thing will work and you will not fail because you've proven it somewhere else and you've proven it in the ROI and the data compliance officer said, it's okay, it works. Exactly. If you have like these statements, they basically de-risk your product and then you build trust and you can sell it. You are exactly right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a people's business. It's like um, the person who is inside this corporate and your buyer is basically um, a human being. And this human being needs trust, first of all, as you said. And it's uh, risk averse. Mm -hmm. This person doesn't want to risk uh, her job. Sure. Because um, she brought you into a company with a technology that is going to create a shitstorm because of I don't know why. Of and um, this is this is um, 
basically one of the most important things in sales, I guess. And this is the reason we do this uh, research about the stakeholders inside the company mm -hmm. and who to approach how. And the private position um, and, and um, the goals the personal goals of your of, of the stakeholders inside the, 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 the company that you want to sell something, that's very important because in the calls that you have with them and in the meetings and sometimes you go have a coffee with them or you have lunch with them, you you have to talk about the private goals of this person to understand what is the motivation of those people and um, somehow play into those um, points, components. Absolutely. That's the B2B sales game, as you call it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I have to say, I don't really like it. Why I mean, not? At, you know, um, it's, 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 of course, much easier if you have a product that is not that complex. And you have, I mean, I'm the founder, one of the founders of the company. I'm the CEO. I love this product. I'm pretty sure that this product is working. And convincing other people that is really that great that you really think it is, that's, that's sometimes making you really tired. Sure. Because you're, you're asking yourself all the time, why do I have to explain my product 10 times? It's clear it's better than the others and it's that, that there is a value. And why do I have to talk to 10 different stakeholders uh, inside a company and um, understand their private and personal goals and talk about it? It's clear that our my product is great. So I, of course, know that it's needed and I, I know also the reason, but sometimes it uh, it's, uh, makes you t just tired. Of course, yeah, but that's probably part of the game, right? Of course, that, that is part of the game, yeah. What KPIs or metrics in general do you focus on during your sales process? Is there anything that you look at in particular? I think that's the, that's the most important management tool not only for sales but especially for sales and marketing as well mm -hmm. so i believe in this only metric that matters so there is just one metric that matters focus on that metric and uh, for us we had to define it as the annual recurring revenues out of software licenses or out of software so it could be data subscription it could be software license subs uh, subscription model but it's annual recurring revenue that the customer is paying you for, uh, you for, for the technology, basically. And that's, I think, a very important point because then you're not only making revenue, but you're also making the right revenue, right? Exactly. And everything you do depends on this metric. And I can tell you, we, we made a lot of mistakes. So, for example, um, at some point we defined the annual recurring revenue in the beginning, we didn't even have these metrics. Mm -hmm. So we, we were just selling stuff and the salespeople uh, were selling services and uh, we were even happy when we sold hardware. That's bullshit. So, I'm sure uh, your tech team was not happy that much. No. Like no, too happy really, about that. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> so at some point we defined metrics. Okay, let's focus. Uh, let's take metrics as a tool to sell the right stuff. So we defined uh, annual recurring revenues, but we didn't define what the re annual recurring revenue really is. So software licenses for a proof of value project of three months, eh, that's not really what you want. You want um, multi-year um, subscription of, of uh, software, so three years, for example, in our industry. And that's, that's much more difficult and you should focus much more on that. But if you really want to deliver annual recurring revenues, you need proof of value packages. So our second or um, one level deeper underneath the, the annual recurring revenue as only metric that matters, we had this uh, proof of value metric. Um, not not the, uh, the, the money was important, it was the amount of proof of values because okay. the proof of value would lead to annual recurring revenue. Yeah. So we had this on the wall, proof of value packages. And then people started to sell proof of value packages because the, this was the metric on the wall. Sure. And nobody cared about annual recurring revenues when they, <laughs> they, when they were talking to the customer. Yeah. So we just assumed if you sell a proof of value package, this will lead to an annual recurring revenue. So we, start, we, we realized at some point uh, we are selling proof of values successfully, but 
in the end, when it comes to this, uh, to, to the end of the proof of value, you realize, oh my God, um, this customer is not going to um, scale and um, to roll out this proof of value because uh, it's not that the return is not that uh, high or um, it's, it's just a fancy game or something that uh, is, is just, I don't know. For some reason, this guy is not going to roll it out and you can't even use it for other customers. So then, then you realize that the, the wording of this metric was the wrong one. Mm -hmm. So we started calling it annual recurring revenue evaluation project. <laughs> <laughs> so just naming it in another way led to a different kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. So then we started to offer to the customer rollouts and the first phase would be an evaluation phase. And then we started to drop customers because we realized, okay, this is not an evaluation case for an American revenue. This would be just a fancy proof of value that has no future. Just the wording. And then really focus again on, on the right customers with the right revenue. That's your goal to also be able then to scale it up and exactly. have a, a product that is actually giving you this recurring revenue. I exactly. think this is very important. It's not even that easy. I, I can imagine. I mean, otherwise, all of us would do it, right? Yeah, I, I, I still don't know if we have the right metrics, but I, I, in the meantime, I really believe that the most powerful tool you have in a company uh, management tool is our metrics. Okay. And we are, this January, for example, we were talking three weeks about our OKRs again. And it's okay. like um, three weeks of discussion because we were not aligned when it comes to the OKRs, company OKRs, circle and team OKRs. Um, we don't um, discuss in the, in the whole company about the individual OKRs, but company OKRs and derive the team OKRs. Uh, I mean, you, you know what the OKRs yeah, are. Yeah, objectives, objectives and key results, results. Exactly. exactly. So this is key, this is essential. It's like really showing to people what to do. And if you have the wrong wording inside one of the key results, you will not achieve what you want to achieve. This is this was crazy when we realized that that yeah. this is so powerful, and also crucial to align the people. I mean, otherwise you will not achieve more with a team, but probably even less than as individuals. Exactly. So the focus, discussing brings the focus. Yeah. By the way, when I would when I would uh, set up the OKRs by myself, it's always a lot of OKRs and it's not really focused. So we discuss it through to the whole team and then we can focus. And alignment, as you said. Alignment that... Um, also team spirit, by the way. It's like um, taught, uh, trying to find the, the right way to achieve a certain com company OKR. Mm -hmm. It's something that brings teams together. And um, also from the team spirit, it was a change. You've given us a very nice sales process blueprint. You walked us through the detailed steps of it. Is there anything else that you would like to add to this episode or a last sales tip that you can give to our listeners? Yes, I think timing or the stage of the startup is very important uh, when you choose the, the style of your conversations with the customer or the strategy, the tactics uh, when you go to the, the customer. So in the beginning, I guess you need also, you need people who understand the technology and the possibilities of the technology or where the technology could be in one year. And that could be anything. So uh, they, they, they should understand that, go to the customer and do much more consulting than sales. Okay. But Aligning it to the roadmap of the company or the vision and strategy of the company, that's the, sometimes the missing piece. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, you have to find out what to give to the customer aligned to the strategy that you have. If you just go to the customer and deliver them whatever they want, right. you will miss the strategy and the vision. So in the beginning, don't hire salespeople. <laughs> it's really... One of the learnings, if you uh, bring in salespeople, these really hardcore salespeople, mm -hmm. they can only sell products which already have proof of concept and proof of value. Yes. Products that you, you exactly know the, the market needs it, 
and you give it to the sales guy and they can sell it. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, you don't have that. If you bring in um, too early salespeople, they are not going to perform. They are going to be pissed at some point. They are not going to be motivated and uh, they will leave the company or you are going to let them go. Uh, so, yeah, that is basically what I can say. Don't hire salespeople too early. I think that's a very good statement or key lesson to take away from this episode and end it with it. Thank you so much for your time, Iman. I wish you all the best and look forward to read about you in the news with all your new robots coming up for the next years. Thank you very much, Silvan, for having me. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of Swisspreneur. If you have any feedback or points we can improve, please let us know and send us an email to info at Swisspreneur.com. If you liked what you just heard, please make sure to follow us on social media and sign up for our newsletter at Swisspreneur.org. See you next time. Thank you.